And the book was written by two very distinguished economists, but it's intended uh, and its actual audience was much broader. And the book suggested that the uh, new economy didn't need a new economics and then explained which economic concepts were applicable and how to apply them. Well, the book is now 15 years old and obviously a lot has happened in the information economy in the intervening years, so it seemed appropriate uh, to see how well uh, it has stood the test of time. And Carl and Hal were kind enough to accept my invitation to do that. And uh, I'm also delighted that Judy Chevalier, who is also an expert on the economics of the information economy, accepted our invitation to guide the discussion. All three of our panelists have extremely impressive resumes, which are given in detail in the program. Hal is chief economist at Google and an emeritus professor at UC Berkeley in business, economics, and information management. He's been a regular participa participant uh, in the Aspen forums, I'm happy to say. Carl is the Trans-America Professor of Business Strategy in the Haas School of Business at Berkeley and uh, also served in government as a member of the uh, Council's President of, uh, the President's Council of Economic Advisors and twice as the uh, Deputy Attorney General for Economics in the Antitrust Division. And uh, this is his second year here, and I hope he will become a regular. And Judy is the William S. Beinecke Professor of Economics and Finance at the Yale School of Management. And we are very pleased to have her here for the first time, and also hope she will be back. And uh, with that, I, I'll hand it over to Judy. Great. Thanks, Tom. Can you guys hear? Is my, is my mic working? OK. Um, well, thanks, guys. OK. so. Um, you know, you have this book about strategy and strategies for the emerging information economy, which was published, I think, in late 1980, 1998. You wrote most of it in 96, 97. So I, I would think, you know, that writing a book about here are strategies to deal with the information economy in 1996 is, is you know, could be a recipe for having an egg, egg on your face in 2014. So I, I thought I would start with a softball, especially so people then don't have to tweet. You know, you can finish eating before you have to tweet. So, you know, how the economic concepts in the book held up? You going to stand by them? <laughs> I disavow the whole thing. No, 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 that's not for the record. Uh, the, uh, you know, one of the things uh, that, that we were doing was bringing in historical examples. And, you know, a book like this, it's not meant to be original research. It's reporting what a lot of people, our work, but many other people's work. So it's really been peer reviewed and tested theoretically, to some degree empirically. And so, uh, so we were on pretty solid footing that way. So it's, it's almost asking like, when Pagu worked on price discrimination in the 20s, how's it holding up? <laughs> okay, so it already had like 75 years of testing. Okay, and of course our point is, those principles will carry over to the information economy. The other thing is, critically, we didn't try to predict the future. We actually said we're not into forecasting, okay? Because we didn't have confidence in that, and we could see things are changing so quickly, and that wasn't the point. So that helps a lot, uh, keeping the egg off the face. Yeah, I, I would uh, go along with that. One of our uh, taglines was uh, technology changes, economic laws stay the same. Maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but that was a general theme of the book that we wanted to argue that many of these principles were uh, timeless, and it was great fun for both of us to dig through this uh, economic history and find the illustrations that uh, match the concepts. So actually, in continuing to answer that question, I, I look back, trying to get myself back in the headset of you know, 1998, okay, and which was, a, things were getting breathless, but not quite as breathless as they were gonna be in 99 and 2000, so we're writing at that time. And when our book came out, I think almost literally the same week, certainly the same month, Kevin Kelly came out with his book, right. New Rules for the New Economy. And on the cover, it says, he explains how the networked economy is turning old economics upside down. So we had this kind of odd thing. And of course, he got a lot of attention. He's the editor of Wired magazine and you know, just a, a visible author um, you know, and a lot of good ideas. So we're kind of like these, oh wait, he has almost the same title, right? Because it's like new rules for the new economy. It's the same time, but it's exactly the opposite message. 
okay? And so, you know, just prepare for this. I, you know, he has 10, he has 10 recommendations. And look, this, I'm kind of, I am poking fun at him, it's true, but there's a lot of good stuff in his book, too. But it's just the difference in style. His, you know, a few of his 10 rules. Embrace the swarm, follow the free, feed the web first, no harmony, all flux, okay? So that's a lot different than the rules we had, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is like, you know, you know, how to engage in price discrimination and you know, how to look for lock-in. You know, we're a lot less sexy, but you know, maybe if you're less sexy, you hold up a little longer. Well, luckily, they haven't <laughs> forgotten about feeding the swarm, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one thing I would say is I'm guessing if you were to write the book today, you might have emphasized different things differently. Right. So one thing is, you know, there's a, a section of the book, a good chunk of the book is about information goods and pricing and strategies for information goods. You have a lot of um, discussion in the book about strategies in network industries, tipping, lock-in. Um, you have uh, some stuff on information policy. I would think it might be the case that you know, if you were thinking about what you might emphasize with hindsight, or where, when you look at the book, what you might emphasize differently. And one thing I might mention here is when I reread the book last week, I noticed, you know, writing it in 1996, seven ish, you were, I think you might, you emphasized a lot information goods and information infrastructure. There was a little bit of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 will lead to some competition here. And I wonder how you might have emphasized things differently, maybe, if you had seen that turn out. Okay, well, I'll lead off on that. Uh, one is, I think we'd say more about advertising. In the book, we talked uh, a bit about uh, search-targeted advertising, actually. Mm -hmm. We said, this is going to be big, and uh, turned out to be right there. But there's a lot more you could say about it. Now, whether we could really say much in depth in 1997, yeah. it's hard to say. But I, in retrospect, I wish we'd talked about that a little more, because it really was the, the a major business model for the uh, internet economy. Another thing that was interesting is we had a chapter actually on auctions and market design in general, which was way back even before eBay had, uh, had uh, grown uh, to any appreciable size. And we talked about auctions and market design and some of these things as ideal economic mechanisms for the internet. We took it out because of lack of space. But if we're doing it again, I would have, uh, would have left that in. Well, let me pick up more on the infrastructure and the telecom act <coughs> part of your question, Judy. So I had just come back from DOJ. I was there in 95, 96 as the chief economist, which is when the telecom act was passed, right? And DOJ was very much involved because my boss, Ann Bingaman, who was running the antitrust division, you know, she was, you know, we, well, DOJ was involved with the, you know, the, the consent decree with AT&T, and you know, we're all wrapped up in that, right? And so, yeah, I, w I would definitely plead guilty, and I think I'm willing to bet a number of you would, <laughs> if, 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 if strapped down, might plead guilty as well to being more optimistic about the, the Telecom Act in terms of, uh, and we heard a little bit about this this morning, in terms of Telric and uh, unbundled elements and 251 and 271 and all that stuff, working better, basically. And so combination of, all right, that's kind of going to be okay, you know, that we, we and that wasn't the focus of the book on the infrastructure. The other thing is, you know, like Microsoft and Microsoft versus Netscape, there's a lot of, you know, that was a big thing in the 90s, you know, the second half of the 90s, and you'll see that in the book. And there, you know, what's the distribution mechanism is, you know, you send out, it, it, it's, it's shrink rack software, okay? You know, and the question is, you know, can Netscape get loaded by OEMs on their computers, okay? So the whole distribution, you know, digital distribution and, and the importance of broadband, while, and we, again, this came up this morning a little bit, while you could kind of get, there was an inkling, you know, broadband deployment is a good thing, it wasn't nearly so central to the strategies we were talking about, and I, for one, certainly didn't, you know, see a lot of, you know, how that could become a bottleneck or issues about market power there, and, and whether the, the telecom act would really, you know, would it fix those problems or where, where would those go? So, so that, was, that was looking around the corner more than, than I was able to do at least in 97, 98. So I guess, you know, we could, we could glory in the hindsight for a while or we could, we could talk a little sure, bit sure, about let's do if, that. if you're, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if, I, if, we were to just, if you were to just draft the next book up here on the stage, 
um, and think about what topics that are out there in strategy, in the news, in policy, that you see that people are not necessarily applying these durable economic principles to and could receive the same kind of treatment that you gave them in information rules, what would be the topics in information rules 2.0? So one of them would definitely be the mechanism design I alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. recommender systems, all of this stuff of how do you help people find their way through this uh, huge uh, maze of, uh, of information. Uh, another one is platform competition and two-sided markets. A lot of what we said in information rules was really about platform competition yeah. and two-sided markets. We didn't use that terminology, but there's been a lot of great research since then that we could uh, talk about. Uh, and then I think <coughs> we'd talk, we had a, <clears throat> chapter on copyright issues, but this, if we're doing it now, would definitely have a chapter on patent issues. That's been huge, of course, and we have one of the leading contributors to that literature uh, as a uh, co-author, so <clears throat> that would be a very natural thing to discuss since it's so much, mm -hmm. so important from the economic and policy viewpoint. You know, if, if you look back at the structure we did, and you, you, you started with this, you know, there's, there's kind of pricing, copyrights, and so forth, uh, versioning, there's lock-in, and then there's network standards. So that'll still take us a long way. I mean, the point is, like, network effects, you know, we were talking about a literature that had largely grown up in the 80s and 90s, although there were antecedents as well, going back to the Bell system and earlier, mm -hmm. okay, that we, we pointed out. You know, a lot of what's happened, like, take social networks, okay, I mean, I know there are people from Facebook here, or, um, you know, or some of the sharing economy stuff that's come up, you know, uh, the, the, where there's you know, where there's networks of buyers and sellers finding each other. It's still network effects. A lot of the same things. So I think it's really a matter of the sort of how have these evolved rather than entirely new topics. Okay, I mean you know the advertising stuff and search. I mean particularly. I mean Hal said something nice about me on the patents. I mean, you know how could we resist? I mean we are talking right. You know Google and search and advertising. And I mean that's a whole you know piece of the economy that didn't didn't exist right. This Google wasn't even founded back then. So, so I think it would be more depth on some of these. You know, it's like social networks is a good example, and I, you know, I would certainly second the patent, the patent stuff. There's more to do on, you know, copyright. I mean, I would do more on, you know, copyright, and you know, it's continually evolving in terms of, you know, rights management issues. Uh, the, those, uh, those have played a bigger role. There's also the international side. We didn't really do it much of the international side. You know, like some of the network stuff. It's like, well, the networks seem to be national and not international so much. And, and how does that work? You know, what's going on with that would be another piece that seemed would be uh, appropriate in the 21st century. Another, another theme that I, that I would really wish we'd said more about, and, and there's a lot of great material today, is, is co-opetition and working with complementers. Because mm -hmm. we said this in the book, every uh, company is part of a system, and so how do you engage with the other players in your, in your system or ecosystem? So you think about uh, Google, which uh, we've got content providers, we've got internet providers, we've got our organizational, uh, you know, how do we organize things, help people find things. Uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, economic models being developed in terms of working with your complementers. So maybe let's pick up a little bit on this uh, point you raised about patents, um, since, uh, as we said, you guys are experts here. Um, so when I, before I reread the book, I was thinking to myself, oh, you know, the thing they missed in this book was surely they didn't say much about standards, essential patents, and patenting. And then I reread the book and realized, actually, you say a lot about right. that. Um, and you lay out a very kind of persuasive framework for how standards bodies should handle pricing and rent extraction um, incentives in, a, in, a, in standards essential patents. But you said you would want to have more about patents. So what are the topics and patents that, um, that, that the next book is going to cover? Well, first off, uh, we're going to have a panel, um, be on panel in another yes, hour on I patents. Know. So uh, we, I won't cover all of that. But, and, and the other thing is, just to go back to the 90s, often for me, you know, it's working with either in government or working with companies that I see what's going on. I don't see it from the economics journals. And I take the idea, you know, I'm seeing what's going on and then figure out, okay, what's the economics behind that? And the reason you see stuff in there about standard essential patents is I had a couple cases mm -hmm. involving these things after I came out of DOJ. It was starting to heat up. Some of them involved modems, okay, uh, for example, which, if you remember such a thing. 
you know, like 56K modems, right? So, you know, you look at these examples and you kind of, you know, kind of smile sometimes because it seems so outdated in technology, but the standard essential patent concepts were the same. Uh, so, so that was kind of an early, you know, warning signal about what was coming. Uh, but to answer, in terms of what's coming, for, look, the, the mass aggregation, you know, the whole, I think it's absolutely fascinating. Just patents is becoming a tradable commodity. You know, the, there are exchanges to trade them. There's uh, people, they're, they're much more buying and selling of them and not just licensing, okay? You know, sort of how they evolve, you know, when companies, you know, sell off chunks of the, you know, and sort of how the whole patent assertion and, and how that's, you know, and there's a lot of issues about that. Uh, we're gonna talk about that, like I said, in one of the panels this afternoon. That's, that's a big one. I think, you know, there's kind of a management side of them about that. Um, and, you know, it relates to vertical integration and, and hold up and, and royalty stacking. And it's not just cell phones. I mean, it's much more broad than that, okay? So, so those, those are the things that we were just, the new institutions that have arisen. Uh, and the, I would say, sluggishness of, of uh, you know, both Congress and the Patent Office and to some degree the courts to evolve with, uh, to change in the ways that I think we need. So that's what I would put in. No. You want to add to that, Hal? No? What can I add? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so one thing we talked about uh, possibly doing here that might be fun for the audience, and, and then you can, um, I'll, we'll have some time for some questions, is um, I thought it might be fun to mention some companies that you couldn't have written about um, when you were writing in 1996. And maybe you can talk about a little how they both maybe illustrate the their success or the challenges they face, illustrate the principles in the book, and or relate to areas of economics or topics that you didn't address that much in the book, but you might think more about going forward. Um, okay. So maybe I'll start with Carl, um, and I'll hand you Netflix. I've heard of them. OK. Um, so I. Uh, I'm pretty sure Netflix was founded maybe right about the time, mid-late 90s, uh, and went to their subscription model kind of very late in the 90s. Uh, so, you know, kind of after we're writing. Uh, so first, it's a good example where that, you know, their distribution method was the postal service, right? <laughs> um, and then, of course, has gone much more to digital, you know, and broadband delivery. So, uh, on the other hand, the, the um, we talk about personalization. I mean, since one of the things I think, you know, you go back and look, and we look pretty good on that in terms of saying, be, with the web, you can personalize services, you can personalize ads. Uh, and so, in that sense, we kind of they, they illustrate that. Uh, and, you know, in the recommendation engines, you know, I don't think I knew about those really back then. Hal probably did because he's usually a few years ahead of me or a few decades on some of the tech. Uh, and that obviously applies to a lot of other companies. Too. So, so the personalization, but then the technology to do it was was uh, was you know, I didn't know about that. Like I said, um, uh, it also shows the, the importance of data, right? Which we didn't really emphasize data as a valuable commodity. So, much. I mean, we talk about, I mean, it's about information. So, data is in there, but notion notion of using data with the lots of people and kind of combining it to then provide a better service. I mean, obviously Google does this. A ton of people do that. So. So that, I think, is a type of scale economy that um, uh, would reflect some of the points we made, but it really is distinct. It's yeah. Yeah. yeah, what do you think on that? Do you have yeah, I would say, well, of course, as you know, I would say it's the data being converted into information that's important because you know, we know the Netflix uh, algorithm uh, had this uh, interesting history. They discovered 75% of their user choices were being driven by the uh, by the recommendations, and so they started this Netflix uh, contest where people competed on uh, improving recommendations, and they were able to get a 10% improvement out of that. So the raw data itself uh, isn't so useful. It's the process that converts that data into information. You know, sometimes I, uh, I say that uh, you know, data is to information like sand is to silicon chips. So that's the really critical uh, competitive advantage, and, and they were able to leverage that for sure. Well, okay, so speaking of data and information, uh, Carl said you had to talk about Google. <laughs> so. Yes, so actually uh, I had a question once. I was, I, I was in a, um, a forum and people, online forum, people sent in their questions. One of the questions is, what's the source of Google's uh, competitive advantage? 
and uh, there doesn't seem to be much in switching costs. There doesn't seem to be a network effect, and that's absolutely right. We all know switching from using Google to using some alternative is a case of pulling up a window and typing in a few words, so that's very, very small compared to the switching costs involving an operating system, for example, or even a mobile phone, for that matter. Uh, so that, that's not an issue, and the, the network effect uh, stuff is really not an issue. I don't care uh, what search engine you use. Well, I do care what search engine you use, but I, it doesn't affect my behavior any. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, where, where does it come from? We, we put a, a blog post out, out about this. My claim is it was learning by doing, an older concept of uh, Ken Arrow wrote this classic paper on learning by doing. The fact that you've really invested a lot and you've built on cumulative improvements over many years does give you an advantage because you've learned uh, intricacies of your business that it's hard for a, a new entrant to really capture. And that's not just true in information industries, that's true in manufacturing industries, all kinds of industries. So this accumulation of knowledge that comes from uh, understanding your uh, customer base and their needs and your technology that's really, I think, what's driving uh, Google at this point. Hmm. Well, let me say something about Google. This was not official. I mean, <laughs> which how I may or may not agree with. Let me put it that way. So first, I, preparing for this, I went back, you know, looked at parts of the book, and somehow there's a there's a heading somewhere, you know, on page 237 or something that says in the part about switching costs says high market share does not imply high switching costs. <laughs> Which somehow Hal very cleverly snuck yes. into the book in 1997, <laughs> before Google was founded, much less before he joined Google. <laughs> okay, and part of this was, you know, we'll find one thing I'm, I like and I'm sort of proud of with hindsight is we went back and kind of warning people like we're going to talk about switching costs, but not everybody has them. We're going to talk about network effects, but they're not ever present. So be careful, don't get carried away. Of course, people did get carried away, but okay. So anyhow, that's in there. I just had to make that point. The other thing is, is you know, I totally agree with you how the low switching costs for the consumer, okay? And, you know, and look, in my mind, certainly back then, you know, Microsoft and Office and Windows was very much central to thinking, and, and, and Intel is another piece of this, you know, the Wintel duopoly was, you know, quite dominant for those years. Um, so, uh, and it's pretty, and look, compared with switching operating system, you know, it's, it's trivial to switch your, which, which search engine you're using. Um, but at the same time, it is, we're in what we now call two-sided markets, okay? Uh, the advertisers, uh, not so easy for them to switch if they want to get to the, the people who are using Google. So this creates, of course, competition to track the users, and then you use that to sell the other side of the market on advertisers. And uh, you know, that's, that's a different dynamic than we, we had in, 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 say, for Microsoft. The other th thing about Google that, that actually does reflect, at least in, in a very high, broad sense of what was in my mind, at least about Microsoft, one of the big issues back then at Microsoft is, all right, they have this really strong monopoly on Windows, and they've got Office. Are they going to extend it to other areas, you know, and kind of extinguish competition in, in adjacent spaces or bundle? You know, all that was a big antitrust question, right? Leveraging, extension. And, you know, one I think is quite, you know, if you'd asked me, you know, I don't know, take when, back when you joined Google, what, 2001, 2002? 2002. You know, like, it's like, this is really cool they do search. You know, are they going to do email? Are they going to do, you know, all the things they do now, right? You know, uh, tons beyond mobile that, obviously. Mobile platform. Yeah. Uh, have a mo I would have thought, well, I don't know. I don't see why. I mean, it's not particularly <laughs> related to search. Like, this is why I don't run a major company, by the way. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, so I think it's been, you know, I think brilliant and effective in terms of their Basically, following the strategy, give it away, build up a base, get good at it, and then uh, you know to to build on their customer relationships in a lot of way, uh, and uh, you know that's that's something everybody tries to do, right? When they get a good solid position, they say, okay, now where do I go from here? I, I, I've kind of got good market share in my area, uh, and and so that's going to perennially be a question for competition policy as well, in terms of. Um, uh, you know, leveraging, and I mean that in a very neutral sense, in a business sense, not in some sort of anti-competitive sense, just leveraging the assets you've got to, to go into adjacent spaces. And I think that's, you know, to me, it, you know, in some ways, a, a, a equally impressive to just how awesome Google search, and I mean, Bing search is good too, very good too, uh, has become, and how much we just take that for granted, is the business strategy of expanding out so much into other areas. 
One, and that, that actually reminds me of another point that I think I would have liked to have seen a few more pages on, and that's multi-homing. Because our model was thinking about uh, you know, office or operating systems, and you wouldn't use two operating systems or two uh, word processes or whatever. You generally uh, pick a single one because of the, of the, well, not exactly switching costs, but multi-homing costs. But for a lot of things today, it's perfectly possible to uh, multi-home. One example, people are talking about Uber having network effects and uh, Lyft having network effects, but you can have Uber and Lyft on the same phone and the same drivers even are using the, the same uh, cars. So there's a lot of cases where you can have networks that are not leading to exclusivity, but actually can coexist. Typically you'd think they would differentiate themselves in, in some way, but uh, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily driving one out just by uh, building up the other. Um, okay, so I, do I have a few? Do we have a few minutes for questions, Tom? Okay. Yeah. You're going to have to speak up, I'm sure, otherwise the people are not going to hear shout. you. Yeah. Sure. I'll take first speech. Oh, oh, even oh. even better. I did 18 years of live radio. I'm used to mics. They help. Uh, I also just reread the book, although frankly I didn't read it very closely 20 years ago, <laughs> and it turns out that your chapters on standards, you did three or four chapters, are absolutely and totally true today. And I say that, and I'm on the State Department ITAC and in the middle of the ITU. So I'll bring the book up and ask you to sign it if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> but the question I have, the cost of making a smartphone is now down at 25 to 50 bucks. This is gonna bring, according to Carlos Slim, two billion more people on the internet, which is something I think a lot of us care about, which means that the cost of the patents and the royalties are becoming a more and more intimidating factor. And many of us think that the level of royalties there are way unreasonable and that fair and non uh, reasonable and non-discriminatory is a bad joke. So I'm trying to think about how to set what is fair, non -dis reasonable, and non-discriminatory? And there's a fellow I know who's very active politically, uh, or international stuff, whose job is being termed out in a couple of months. And I'm trying to talk him into making a speech saying that the level of reasonable should be no more than five or 10% of the cost of the good. Uh, Include, even if there are 100 separate patents, as there are in the cell phone. Now, if somebody influential said that, what do you think the feedback would be in the whole question internationally of setting what a reasonable patent rate is? Well, I think this is an area where actually we've made considerable progress in terms of what uh, the, the standard essential patents and what constitutes fair, fair and reasonable, or reasonable and non-discriminatory royalties. Writing back in 96, 97, I was taking the position that's in the book, actually, about that reasonable would be what you would see from technology competition before people got locked in or before the standard was set. So some patents might get a lot if they were really innovative, you know, and add a lot of value, uh, when there would still be technology competition, ex ante versus ex post you know, perspective. That was very, that was, I don't know that I'll call it heretical at the time, but it was, it was a, that was not accepted. Now I think it's pretty widely accepted. There are a few holdouts. I won't name names and embarrass particular companies. But no. In East Texas, they're setting the world standard. Well, um, so I think there's a growing, I will still say, there's a growing consensus that that is the right uh, conceptual standard. But, and then we, and I don't want to get into too much detail on implementing it. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, the number is 2.73%. Okay, just, let's, I get, you heard it here first. We got it. Okay. I'd be happy to talk with you later. Okay. Yeah. There it comes. I have to say, a lot of that location is not standard. Okay. Uh, yes. <clears throat> One other uh, topic you anticipated is competition for attention. And when I go to the Washington Post website, the advertiser tries to get my attention with a pop-up, and with Google, it does with a text ad. 
So is Google making a mistake? Is the Washington Post making a mistake? Or, the, or there's, is there some economic analysis that says they're each doing the right thing? Well, there's different kinds of advertising. And uh, one of the nice things about the Google text ads, pay-per-click, is that you can target people's interests very closely from looking at the query. So the query is telling you, yes, I'm interested in cheap flights to Hawaii, and we can show ads for cheap flights to Hawaii. And it's the advertiser who's coming up with the keywords to match the user's query. When you look at uh, display ads, the kinds that show up in these pop-ups, they have very little to go on. They don't have any signal as strong as a query signal or any signal often as strong as, as, strong as a contextual signal that you get from other kinds of advertising. So they are, have a much harder job in competing for the user's attention, which is why they resort to some of these techniques. Uh, I would say in this day and age, they're beginning to be, or, or maybe they've been for some time, counterproductive, but you know, that's just a matter of opinion. Can I take one more, Tom? Yeah. So, Harold Feld, I yeah, have to say I have greatly enjoyed this. The one um, thing I would ask you about is was raised very briefly uh, by Carl, which is the, the problem of the two-sided market. Um, and particularly, how two-sided market effects layer on top of the switching cost effects, layer on top of the yeah, network effects. Uh, and uh, what I am seeing in a lot of places in the market where you are having sort of this very peculiar interaction where we don't have a lot of guidance from the academic literature about whether this is good or bad for consumers. Um, and I wonder if you've just uh, uh, have any thoughts about the increasingly multi-layered nature uh, of the problem, particularly because I suspect that it's, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not good. Um, so any, any thoughts? Is this just like the next frontier of research, or is this something that you, you, you guys have been thinking about going forward? Well, I'll, I'll say a word or two about that and then and turn it over to Carl. The, um, a case from Google that's very interesting is Android, because when Android came out, it had no market share. There was a very, very strong uh, competitor who'd, uh, who'd built up an entire infrastructure. And so we had two markets we had to appeal to. We had to appeal to the consumers to sell the product. We had to appeal to the developers to develop apps. I guess three markets. We had to appeal to the handset makers. And they had to appeal to the uh, carriers. So it was a case of building up this entire group of not just two sides, but however many I said, a five-sided market, because you had all those pieces in order to make it, uh, make it work. And this is something that um, it's very hard to do because you have to be fighting a battle on all these fronts at once, trying to get people's attention, trying to get the developer's attention, trying to get the handset maker's attention in order to succeed in building up, uh, building up the market. Well, look, I think this, this area is one, there has been a lot of work in the last 10 years or so, you know, two-sided markets, maybe the term's only about 10 years old I'm not, or so. Um, and so I, I, part of my answer is, yeah, I think the, the economists need to work more on this. And I think behind, maybe behind your question, you didn't say the words net neutrality, but it's kind of related to that. Today, but it's a very much broader issue. For example, today is, I think, the very last day or maybe tomorrow of a weeks-long trial between the Justice Department and the American Express over credit card practices, the American Express practice. And there, the DOJ is basically saying American Express, they have various rules regarding merchants that restrict competition. These merchants, it's very hard for a lot of merchants, particularly in travel and entertainment, not to take American Express. American Express says, what are you talking about? The only, we have to fight like hell to get cardholders to carry and use our cards. There's all this competition. And you know, they're talking about, the, the tend to, American Express tends to be talking about the, uh, con, the consumer side, and the DOJ tends to be talking about the merchant side, and the judge is going to have to figure out how to put those two together. Uh, there are a number more examples of that where I think we know it's complicated. I don't have a crisp you know, answer for you, Harold. Uh, and when, particularly when you then intersect that with uh, some other sector-specific regulation, okay? Uh, but I think, you know, one of the principles we probably do get is you can't look at one side in isolation, okay, and, uh, and hire a good economist. <laughs> <laughs> at least one. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. Great, okay, thanks.